in that ass sink. That's not what we do. That's not what we do. Okay. We could. We could, but we're not. I'm putting my foot down here. That's your fist. We are not. I'm putting my <laughs> foot down. We are not ass clap sinking for the podcast. As entertaining as that might be. Don't just want to give a little bounce and... No. <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't think I want that, actually. Hey. I feel like we're a little quiet. I'm going to make us louder. Wow. We'll keep that in. Fuck it, I don't care. I don't give a shit. I got way too much going on in my life. You know. That's fair. Yeah. Summer is busy. A busy time. Oh, it's just... It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It should be like when we were kids and we just got fuck all going on, you know? Oh, I need to... Oh, my big my big thing today is I need to run to little Timmy's house because he's having a pool party and I'm mm-hmm. going to be in the pool for eight hours and I'm going to get sunburned. I'm going to throw up because I'm eating too much candy and then I'm going to go home. I'm going to be miserable for the next week and a half because I'm sunburned, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Be great. But no, I've got to go to work. Yep, got to go to work. Got to go to work, and I got to talk about at work how the president almost got assassinated. Yeah, Former president thing. almost got assassinated. Yeah. Anyway, we're next... not going to talk about that on this, the Lord's 71st episode of the Duels of Manadors podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. We like to talk about magic. We like to talk about D&D. Mm-hmm. We like to talk about, talk about D&D and magic at the same time. Yes. Sometimes. Because they they cro- they've crossed over on several occasions at this point. They have. We've had several D and D sets in Magic. We've had several Magic playing books in D and D. Yeah, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. But we'd love to see more. We'd love to see more. Uh, and in fact, we have seen a little bit more of Dungeons and Dragons stuff, which mm-hmm. is pretty exciting. Uh, not a whole lot really worth talking about ultimately a few things that we'll we'll mention but nothing nothing super major they've been releasing a lot of videos but it's all kind of stuff that we've been hearing about for a long time through unearthed arcanas and stuff and they've put out what now almost a a, what 16 18 videos about this new uh up about the upcoming release of one D &D. and it's like yeah we've all right, yeah, that 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 mechanic or that uh, that design aspect. Yeah, you've talked about that seven times now. Yeah, we're we're familiar with the weapon masteries. Yes. All right. Ooh, we get it. The bard's gonna be able to do more inspiration. Yeah. The monk's gonna have more. Oh, they're not called key points anymore. What are they? Focus. Focus points. Sure. Sure. I'm excited to actually get my hands on the book and like I think, fuck around with it. I think that would be the definite. Uh, you know, it's 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 the we're tired of hearing about. Just give it to us. Which yeah, they're giving it to us in two oh. months. Oh, oh, oh Watts, he's giving it to us. All right, all right. They're giving it to us real hard, real hard. In in pace of release, mm-hmm. in pricing of release, mm-hmm. in f- I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say. Well, next, I was gonna make a. It was going to be a sex joke. Oh, sex joke. Yeah. Insert sex joke here. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you want to go hands-on with D&D books, I imagine you'll be able to do that at Gen Con this year. Gen Con 2024. We're going to be there. It's July 31st to August 3rd. Is that accurate? Is, are those the dates? It is, in <laughs> fact. It's uh, Thursday to Sunday. August 1st August to 1st August to 4th. 4th. All right. August 1st to August 4th, Gen Con. We're going to be there all four days. We're going to be D and a D. Sam's going to be, Sam's going to be playing some TCGs, yes. learning to plea EZs. Yes, I'm going on a little little tour of uh, the big TCGs, mm-hmm. checking those out. You're going, you might actually Pokemon, go up on Flesh and Blood. Flesh and Blood up. Uh, uh, Star Wars Unlimited. Yeah, I might be going up early for something, but you know, TBD, TBD, to be con- to be determined. I've got I've got a couple um, a tour set up for a couple for, for. I don't know if I should talk about it before, but I'm gonna be. Able, uh, I, I, I'm, we'll say you have a press pass. I have a press pass, so I'm able. So I've been getting a lot of like marketing emails and stuff about. Do you want to set up and like book an appointment to come see it? And I've done that once mm-hmm. for one thing. Um, I'll say it's the one. It's the One Ring RPG. Because of course it is. It's right in your wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten an invite to do something on the Wednesday before Gen Con. I might go up early just to see what's going on with that. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. That'll be pretty fun to talk about uh, on the podcast if if that does end up happening. We need to look, I need to look at the calendar and see 
when the podcast lives. Like, if Gen Con happens, like, right in that weekend between we record, like, I feel like that'd be a dynamite spot. Well, yeah, so we'll put out, uh, we'll record next on the 30th of this month, and then Gen Con will happen, and then we'll have a week, mm-hmm. then we'll cut back, and then we'll have a week after we get back mm-hmm. to before we record. We might, we might, we might, we might just do an extra one. Well, bonus, bonus, bonus action. We'll see. We'll see. Just us chatting about Gen Con. Maybe. Possibly. But we are going to be at Gen Con. It's going to be a very good time. Um... Yeah, that's kind of all we got going on right now. <laughs> got Gen Con going on, and that's exciting. I can't wait to play some Commander. Yeah, with some other people. That'll be fun. Um, we didn't end up getting tickets for the Bloomberg precons. No, yeah, like they you said, were sold they out. Went quick. Yeah, shockingly so. There's uh, there's like chaos precon events going on where they just give you whatever, which I'm a little bit weary of because they're the same price as the brand new precon event. And they're probably going to give you some shit precons. But yeah, I'd rather I'd much rather try like a. Uh, uh, Pre, a, a chaos draft or something like mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. or if uh you know like gavin Vare he does at magic cons he does like these just whole chaos events yeah those are fun those are, i would love if they would do if he like because like uh, game nights is coming to gen con this year mm-hmm. uh i would love if in you know some point gavin Vare he came and was like hey let's do a weird thing and we could we could get in the queue to sign up on time yeah that's the that's the hardest part is just everything sells out so quickly that you can't really like get in on anything um but yeah it's a whole there's a lot of cool stuff yeah and i'm excited to i'm excited to partake in it uh one thing we talked about this recently that uh we will not there will not be um there will not be the crit awards at gen con no. But they just they just announced recently that they're doing a virtual event yes. on like the nineteenth of our I can't remember. It's later, it's after Gen Con is done. It's a virtual event. They're gonna be it on twitch.tv. I was trying to find the post, but they had posted their Instagram apparently. It was only on Twitter, but whatever. Um we 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 support the Crit Awards and mm-hmm. we like what's going on there. The Creator Recognition Tabletop RPGs Award. We had Ivy on for a couple of bonus actions, which has been nice. We've also had Typical Gemini on for a bonus yes. action. We talked about Modern Horizons three. Um, Assassin's Creed isn't really big enough to have him on again, but once Bloomborough is out, I feel like we're going to have him on to talk about Bloomborough, which will be a fun little bonus action to do. He's going to be kind of like our our set review guy. Yeah, that we go to. Today. We got a guy for that. We got a guy for that. Yeah, he's really cool. Uh, you can also check him out on YouTube if you like deck techs that are under like $25 because he does a lot of those and they're really cool. So check that out. Uh, if you want to, well, we gotta, I, we got to do the whole spiel. A whole spiel. We got to do the whole spiel. Of whole course. Spiel. The Duels of Man Doors podcast. We talk about D&D Magic the Gathering. If you enjoy it, you can get it on podcast services around the globe. Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, YouTube for the video podcast every other Monday at 1230 uh, it releases a week earlier on Wednesday, the week before it releases, for the free feeds around the globe, on our Patreon, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. You can join that for free if for you free. want. When you For free. That's Adam Sandler, in case any are too young to get that reference. Because I feel like Adam Sandler isn't, like, hip anymore. He's not, like, the guy. No, no, he... They know him for, like, grown-ups, and we know him for, like, Big Daddy and, like, Billy Madison. Yeah, you know? it's true. I know him for the Hanukkah song. Oh, yeah. Don't forget your yarmulkes. It's time it's to celebrate. It's time Hanukkah. for Hanukkah. Anyway. Yeah, that was when he was on SNL. That was a good time. Anyway, Adam, Adam Sandler follows us on Patreon. He doesn't do that at all. That'd be cool uh, if he did. You can, join for, you can join the Patreon for free. If you join for free, you get access to uh, the weekly threads where you can ask questions to be answered on the podcast. You can vote in polls for video ideas and guests and all that sort of thing. But if you support us at the $5 tier, which is the tier that will never go up, you can get early ad-free access to all of the podcasts on the Wednesday before they release. Uh, early access to the videos that we post on YouTube, which have not happened yet because things are in flux at the Dungeon Home. Indeed they are. It's a whole... We'll get into that in August. But indeed we will. Indeed we will. And then, of course, if you want to get your name right at the end of the show, you can support us at the $15 tier. Which our good friend Brandon Voldez, because he's a good guy. He's a good, handsome man. And good if old do, boy. And if you don't want to give us your money, you can always support us for free on all those other platforms. Like, mm-hmm. subscribe, uh, leave some comments. Reviews, all that sort of stuff. Anyway. Tell your friends. Oh, the, the the Monday Night Magic live streams on YouTube and TikTok as well are a great time. We had fun last night. We were playing, uh, Sam was playing one of his new Assassin's Creed decks. He was yeah. playing Bossum. Bossum. Bassum. Bassim. Well, historics, mostly equipment. It's pretty fun good time yeah oh, wow. you you lost twice to my pdh deck and then you fucking clowned on my 
particularly powerful auras deck that yeah, doesn't cool. limit itself to commons. So, you know, variants. <laughs> Love variants. Anyway, we're going to get into the upcoming releases as we always do. Sam, take it away. All right. First, we have the D&D releases. The last of the 2014 5th edition release is out today as of recording july 16th that is the quest from the infinite staircase this year's anthology book anthology books are almost always the best deal yeah. you can get in terms of D supplements and pre-written stuff yeah this time it's six adventures and they are thick yeah norm because we've had um oh my god the radiant citadel radiant citadel and that was like 20 something like yeah little mini they're basically like single sessions whereas these are like multiple like it's going to take multiple sessions to get through the um quest for, they are like reimagining some like old adventures from D&D yeah. 2 and modernizing it uh and because the revision to 5th edition is going to be backwards compatible all of these things are not going to be useless once you get your new core yes. rule books as well uh next up speaking of the new core rule books exciting the 2024 a revision of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, or uh, as it used to be called 1D&D. The Player's Handbook will be coming out on September 17th of this year, just two months away. With the, oh, God, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> with the Dun- Dungeon Master's Guide coming out two months after that on November 12th. And next year, on February 18th, we will have the Monster Manual. Those are full releases, uh, I believe, two weeks early for a uh, local game store and D&D Beyond releases. Exactly. If you get it on D&D Beyond, you can do a digital bundle where it's like a little bit cheaper to get all three as well digital and physical bundle actually you can yeah. get six where it's the three physical and the three digital and it's like i mean it's a lot of money obviously sure but it's much less than if you bought them a la carte so check that out if you're okay with using dnd beyond i know people aren't necessarily okay with using dnd beyond anymore which is your own prerogative feel free yes um moving on to magic the gathering uh the assassin's creed universe's beyond set is out now it released last friday Buy singles. Buy singles. Do not buy a box. Do not buy packs. Buy singles. If you want to buy a box and packs, wait a couple months, and they'll probably drop, like, uh, the... It's already down to, like, 110. Yeah. The the booster box is, and I imagine it's going to be under 100 very soon. Yeah. Black Friday, you're going to be able to get that thing for dirt cheap. I tell you that much. Yeah. I know we were saying, you were saying you're a little softer on that set uh, mm-hmm. a- after a week of looking at it. Well... So the, my problem with Aftermath was my problem with Aftermath is a lot of the cards there were there were a fair few mythics that had that held some decent value yeah. like $10 or more. Yeah. Um beyond that nothing really had any amount of value and then the card designs while not bad nothing was like super crazy impactful. I think like reckless handling was maybe useful because it was a tutor kind of it was like a more expensive gamble but it limited on what you could get and it it, the the card pool was super super limited yeah whereas assassin's creed the card pool while still limited compared to a regular set is a bit wider Mm -hmm. so i feel like you're going to get more variants out of the packs and while the top end in terms of card price with the exception of uh, Edward Kenway. Yeah. With the exception of Edward Kenway, the top end of price for cards in Assassin's Creed is going to be lower than um, than Aftermath. The card quality, in terms of design, I think is much better in Assassin's Creed than it is in Aftermath. And, be- and despite that, it's going to be opened a lot more than Aftermath was because it's a yeah. universe is beyond. And the singles are going to be a lot more affordable than aftermath singles are simply because of supply yeah so i in in that regard i'm more happy with um assassin's creed than i have been with with aftermath despite the fact that aftermath created uh probably my favorite commander with narset enlightened exile so. yeah yeah i think my problem uh, with with the assassin's creed overall was that it was not built for a format it really wasn't and so you have a smattering of things some that'll find places in commander some that'll find places in in uh in other legacy formats um very not, small places. very small i do expect this to be one of those where it's like five years from now we're talking and it's like all right this new commander card uh here's a great uh, a great synergy piece from it and people go like like people do with new Capenna commander cards like what the hell is I've never seen that card it's yep. like yeah uh, this actually came out in Aftermath or this came out in Assassin's Creed mm-hmm. and they're like 
Okay. I will say the free running cards are going to be very useful for Commander. Yes. Like, very useful. Yeah. Uh, one, I mean, one of them is a draw three for two mana if for free run. If mm-hmm. you get the free running cost going, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Oh but. yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> moving on. A little distracted. As we were uh, mentioning earlier, Bloomborough. The pre-release starts July 26th with full release August 2nd at Gen Con. At Gen Con. If you are listening to the podcast on free feeds, that means this week it's coming out for pre-release. Yeah. Uh, we will be talking about that a little bit later in the episode. Uh, and, of course, we're looking forward to doing some probably pre-release kits and a little limited build for that. Moving on, we have Duskmorn House of Horror, which will pre-release on September 20th with full release on September 27th. Uh, we just saw a few preview cards for that last time. See the boiler season, thankfully, is a little bit away. Yeah, thank God. And then, uh, of course, the surprise set of this year, Foundations. Uh, Surprise. Surprise, yes. The minimum five-year standard rotation yes. will be releasing on November 15th. If you don't know... It's a core set. Hmm? It is effectively the same vibe as a core set, except they're even digging in more. And it's like, this is going to be like, if a Magic... They they call it, if a Magic the Gathering set was called Magic, Magic the, the Gathering. Gathering. And that's it. Um, the, it it's interesting that they're going to do a five-year rotation for Standard, if not longer than that for Foundations. Um, so there's going to be a lot of cards that are just going to be ever-present and available, including things like Lana War Elves. Yeah. So, and omniscience. That'd be fun. So that'll be interesting. I think Foundations is going to be a good set. Yeah. Just, it, se- it seems like it has to be. <laughs> if it isn't, then like they're really fucked. Because then they just can't design just a magic set anymore. Yeah. It's... Then they can only do weirder things like Thunder Junction or Bloomborough or Duskmorn House of Horror or, you know. Yeah. And I'm hoping that the... Uh... The the <clears throat> uniqueness and the funness of things that come from Bloomberg and Duskmore and all these interesting sets doesn't diminish the uh, the 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 staying power the 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 in mm. ingrainedness of mm-hmm. these found of this foundation set hopes to bring. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's going to be just like a nice like platform that all of these other cards they make can kind of be lifted up in standard. And I think just having that baseline standard of cards Mm -hmm. for standard is going to be helpful, which is what the core sets really always were. And ever since they got rid of them is when standards started going away. So there you go. Let's bring it back. All right. Before we get back to the rest of this episode of the duels and mana dorks podcast, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor proxy forge. ProxyForge creates high-quality Magic the Gathering proxies for you to use in your Commander decks and really anywhere you want. You can get custom Magic the Gathering packs that include CEDH staples as well as monocolor Commander staples, cycles of expensive cards like Tutors and the Swords. You can also get upgrade packs for Commander Precons that include 10 cards to soup up your favorite Precon. If all you want is a very simple mana base, you can get any of the cycles of lands as well as lands organized by color pairing. And that's not to say anything about the custom art soul rings you can acquire, as well as the plethora of singles available to you. Use the link in the description below to help us out and check out Proxy Forge to help bling out your board state. Let's move on to the main the main topics of discussion today. Yes. We've got D and D, we don't have. It's been it, they they did their big push of here's all our videos. Yeah. Hi, hello. This is editing Connor. You might be listening to this thinking, "Wow, wow, what happened to that audio there? That's really weird that that cut out." Yeah, um, technology is a bitch. But yeah, we basically just talk about the monk and the bard and the sorcerer and the charmed condition a little bit. Uh, we get into a little bit later here. Don't worry. And we explain a little bit of what the, the future plans are so that this doesn't happen again. But yeah, I'm really over using these uh, these virtual like audio patch cables that help us route things because we have multiple microphones. So it won't be a problem in the future. But for now, it's a thing. We're going to have a little cut here and enjoy the rest of this episode also proxy forge you hear that ad if you're on the if you're on the patreon you didn't proxy forge is cool you should check them out but you know or join the patreon you don't have to listen to their ads anymore anyway bye <laughs> <laughs> to be fair don't know i don't know when the cut just happened because uh we lost audio from yeah. Force meter this is going to get better in the future um in starting in late August, early September, things are going to get a little bit easier. We'll talk about why that is, but um, for now, 
for now, we're talking about the sorcerer. Yes. And <laughs> meta magic. Uh, and the meta magic, the, the, um, the resources, the, all these different resources, like we said, you're, you're now having more chances to get them back. You're having more of them in general. They're caught. Things are costing less. If, if you're going into a big fight, obviously you can just go nuclear and spend them all at once. But if you're going to like have a day of adventuring, you might not know how many opportunities, one, you're going to have to use them or two, how many opportunities you're going to need to use them. Exactly. And it's that kind of thing where it's like, OK, now we're giving they're giving us a safety net of you can use them because you don't want to just hoard that resource to when you need to use it and never need to use it because basically you never had that resource in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, it, the, a lot of, again, the, a lot of the changes are going to be, they're going to upset some people. We talked about the Paladin mm-hmm. and how the Divine Smite is going to upset a lot of people because you can't just spam it all the time and it requires a spell cast and it requires, and I get it. I get it. But, the paladin already had a whole lot of power with divine smite. The mm-hmm. sorcerer had a lot of power with meta magic, and reining that stuff in is just going to make it smooth out the experience for everyone at the table. And while still that class is going to be very powerful, and just have different options and more utility to help offset that lack of just raw power. Yes, you know, I do um, know, I do. Yeah. Not a whole lot that I want to go into with the specific classes and subclasses right now. I think that that conversation really needs to wait more for when we have uh, the books in front of us and can really like have a deep dive mm-hmm. discussion into that. Smell the book, Ooh. like the book. The book, the new book smell is a is a thing. Mm-hmm. So that's fair. We're gonna talk about stat blocks now. Uh, we've seen one YouTuber. I can't remember his name. I apologize very greatly, but. He got access to um, a stat block for the Sphinx of Wonder, specifically. Uh, But we get a view of what monster stat blocks are going to look like right now. And some decisions I'm like, great, love it, full send. Some decisions I'm like, interesting. Mm -hmm. Don't know why you would do that. I don't think anything they've done here is particularly bad. I just think it's a little bit strange. Okay. Okay. So the main thing, um, AC, HP... Those are abbreviated now. Great. So they take up Love less it. space. Uh, initiative has been given its own stat placement up with AC, HP, speed, that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, below them is where you have resistances. I feel like resistances should be up with AC and hit points. That's and fair. Resistances and immunities and that kind of stuff. I feel like the reason they're doing that is because they're lumping in condition immunity and resistances with damage immunity and resistances so it's kind of like a where do you want it sort of thing yeah that's fair um but let's get into the uh the elephant in the room which is the stats Mm -hmm. specifically um we have a nice little spreadsheet of stats now we we here at the dungeon bros uh love a spreadsheet we love a spreadsheet but it is a lot of numbers and for most all stat blocks these numbers are going to be very redundant yes so we have Obviously, strength, dex, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. You get to see the score. You get to see the modifier next to them. And then next to that, you get to see the saving throw modifier as well, which is nice because there. I know that there are new DMs and it's like, oh, this creature needs to make a dexterity saving throw. And then they go to the saving throws line and it would say strength. And like nothing else, or strength and con, and nothing else, or yeah. like intelligence and wisdom, and nothing else. And it's like, do they have a bonus to their dexterity saving throw? It's like, yes, it's just their dexterity modifier. And so, in a lot of cases, it's going to be redundant because they're going to show, if for the example of the Sphinx of Wonder, it has a dexterity saving throw of plus three, mm-hmm. and its modifier is plus three. Yeah. And that's just going to be how a lot of stat blocks are. Um, it's a little bit cluttered. But at the same time, I feel like it just generally takes up less space and gives you more useful information than the previous array of stats. I think that I like this uh, this layout because yeah, exp- well, on these lower level monsters, it will it's a little null point, you know. When you get to higher level things, that's when it's going to start being okay. Now this is where, especially as a DM, a quick reference is good, but secondarily. Uh, players often have access to uh, stat blocks for NPCs or for summons or for things like that. And uh, as I've been playing my, in a, in a game recently, um, we're, we're very high level now. Well, we're actually only level 12, but we're at the end game. 
and uh, we each have a lot of companions, and now we're getting access to NPCs for this final battle, and uh, it'll be like, okay, they all get hit by an area effect. They have to make a save, and it's like, okay, now now whoever has the stat block has to figure out, especially because most people in the group aren't DMs, have to figure out, ah, the, uh, oh, the uh, save is, uh, 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 nope, it's not that, and then... For simplification, yes, I agree. It is a little cluttered, but for the simplicity's sake, I like this. It gives more information, and a lot of the information is going to be redundant, and it is what it is. There's not going to be a perfect stat block. There's going to be what's best for each individual person, and they kind of have to design to the lowest common denominator in mm-hmm. some ways. Uh, so just trying to make it as easy for as most peop- the most people as possible. Yes. Um you still get skills that are listed out individually for skills that are going to get a bonus more than uh, the normal bonus they would get from the yeah. regular ability modifier. Uh, resistances, those are less useful. Those are a little less useful, but resistances are then under that. I think it would be useful to have that up by H- uh, HP mm-hmm. and AC personally. Uh, but I mean, that would take up a lot of space in that area where they're trying to do a two column thing. So I get it. Uh, Then you get the senses, the language, the CR. Then they're breaking up the majority of the stat block into how you're going to be using those features. Yeah. So they have the traits section, which are like the passive things like magic resistance. You have advantage on saving throws against magical attacks and magic sources. Then it shows you your actions. It'll give you bonus actions, reactions, and then they're going to be grouped like that. So you kind of have a bit better organization for what your monster is doing in combat. And they've already kind of introduced that a little bit with Tasha's. Yeah. As well. And we, I really like, we both really like that because it's always, it's always a pain in the butt to be like, okay, it can do these seven things, but these are bonus. Uh, and then I'll do that. Nope. I can't do both of those turns. Now it's very easy. It's blocked out. All right. Yeah. This I get to do once per turn. This I can do once per turn. And this I I get to hit by attack. I can do. Exactly. Exactly. I think the stat block is a market improvement. I agree. In general. It's going to be pretty good. We also have seen now the cl- uh, character sheets. Yeah. Which they made some... They made some choices. They did. I I think it's just going to be getting used to the design of it. Um, also, I just want to point out something to you. Modifiers, the big number, confirmed by D&D. It is canon. Big number, big number, big box crowd. You're done. You're Get gone. Out. Get, Get out of here. here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Get out of here modifier goes in the big box because it's the important number the important number goes in the big box not the bigger number okay the score doesn't matter it matters that it's a plus three it does okay i agree and they've confirmed that when they have broken down each of the uh stats strength it says modifier and that's where the big box is and then to score in a little box to the right of it because it's less important okay i've been saying it for you i've been saying it for years it's less important is that too soon? <laughs> is it too soon to do a Trump voice now? I don't know. I think it's fine. Yeah, he, he, was at, he was at the yeah, he was RNC. A, yeah, yeah, he was alive at the convention. It's fine. Um, <laughs> they've also grouped the saving throws and then the skills associated with each mm-hmm. ability score uh, in the same place. As opposed to being alphabetical. Exactly. Now, there are some people that preferred alphabetical because it's like, I need acrobatics. I, I know where it is alphabetically. Oh, if I need to make a um, if I need to make a history check, you might not intuitively know that a history check <laughs> is an intelligence check. That was me checking because I wasn't sure if it was intelligence or wisdom. I assumed it was intelligence, but I wanted to confirm that so I didn't look like an idiot on the podcast again. I was gonna say as I often at this very moment this because very it's moment, going to happen like soon. Idiot. It's gonna happen soon and frequently. Okay. And so I get it, it's like I don't know what ability mm-hmm. you is used to make a history check so it's easier to just find it alphabetically and then over time learn that. Um in my usage of D D, I have not used a base 2014 D character sheet yeah. in Basically, since I first started playing, because I found on Drive Through RPG this wonderful pack of um, custom-made class-specific character sheets. Yeah. So, like, you can get the fighter one, and it lists all the features on the right side, and it fills in the ones that are common among all the subclasses, and then leaves blanks the ones where um, 
your subclass features are filled in. You can get generic ones where it's just martial and then they're all blank and yeah. it's set up more for a martial class or you can get a spellcaster one where it gives you like a short a uh, small list of like your favorite spells that you cast regularly so you have those stats on the very front page and what they would do with the ability scores is they would group the skills by which score which ability score is being used mm-hmm. for those skills and i always preferred it that way because yeah. it made it easier to fill out the character sheet and do the math and figure out what your bonuses for everything was uh so i'm a fan of that but i also understand why there's some people that would be annoyed by that decision for the character sheet yeah i think that Exactly what you're saying is um, th- these. I think this is a very uh, a kind of a moot point um, when it comes to people's preferences because, like you said, there are so many on Drive Through RPG, on Etsy, on just the internet that's like, hey, here's somebody who designed a, one that they like, or here's one that is a bunch of art on it as well. Like the uh, you know the armor class would be in a shield shape. Um, or I know plenty of people who just like to draw their own character sheets because oh, that's yeah. fun for them. Yeah, and that you do whatever works for you. If you like the old one, you can still use the old one. It's not like the new one has any new feature that you won't be able like. Yeah, Watsy's not going to send you a cease and desist letter. Literally. Well, I mean, they might send the Pinkertons, but that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other issue we can get into. Just get a knock at the door, <laughs> yeah. uh, sir. Are you using a non non 2024 edition? Uh, character sheet. Get out the fucking belly clubs and they just start beating you. <laughs> Your wife is scared and stop, please, no, let him go. <laughs> they take a finger. They take a finger. Which one? They take the ring finger for Assassin's Creed. Or is it the middle finger? It's uh, the for Assassin's Creed, it's the ring finger. Yeah, they take that one, and then they throw beyond booster. <laughs> <laughs> like you fucking buy that now. <laughs> they throw it at you and then take eight dollars. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, they sent the Pinkertons for the Aftermath set. It wasn't even like March of the Machines or anything. It was for Aftermath that they did that. That was wild. That was that was a good (laughs) god. That was wild. God damn, man. That was when we had like funny, crazy shit to talk about more often. That was (laughs) twenty twenty three was a wild year, dude. It felt like every other week. It's like we couldn't even talk about like let's go over previews. It's like no, let's go over how they sent a fucking assassin group basically Mm -hmm. after a guy that they sent the wrong product to. Anyway, (laughs) top line of the character sheet, you're gonna have your character name, background, species, all that kind of fun stuff. You have your level, you have your XP, and then armor class, hit points, hit dice death saves all that kind of stuff right top line right at the top right easy to access i will say i like them i do like those there for exactly that reason because mm-hmm. man those the character sheet can get cluttered quickly and just to find the things that you need most yeah. often it's all if it, the t- honestly the top half the top third of the character sheet is kind of the most important because you get your initiative, speed, size is an interesting one that yeah. I don't know why is on the front. It just seems kind of like it's taking up space. Passive perception, I like that they're still insisting like you should know what your passive perception is. People should use passive mm-hmm. skills more regularly. And then you have all your weapons and your cantrips and stuff. And then all of like the pertinent information is in like, that top right third yes. of the character sheet. Uh, you then get class features on the front. Wow. Which is pretty nice because the original neat. the original character sheets like they're gonna take a whole lot of space for like your personality traits and all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. It's like useful stuff, but you don't need it on the front of your character sheet. You got a space a big big space to put all of your class features. You can also put your species traits and your feats as well. I like that they've moved to check boxes for yeah. some of the proficiencies in the bottom left for armor specifically, uh, and then they have weapon and tool proficiencies there as well. The back side of the character sheet, we haven't really seen the full view of, but it looks like uh, they're giving you a lot of space for spells, Mm -hmm. interestingly enough. Uh, A lot of the classes that aren't even spell casting classes are going to have access to a fair number of spells, and I'm interested to see if there's going to be an alternate back option for those that aren't going to have spells, because it literally takes up two-thirds of the back character sheet. Yeah, yeah. you also have a small box for your appearance. You get your various backstory, personality, alignment stuff on the back as well. Small section for languages. Small section for equipment. I like having a larger section to like write out all your equipment because I got big fat hands and I write big. You do. So I like having a big chunky, like the, the character sheets that I use, the top third of the back of the character sheet is just equipment. Mm-hmm. 
And actually, actually, it's not because I got a, I found an equipment sheet specifically <laughs> that gives you a big box at the top, and then a whole bunch of smaller boxes that you can you can flavor it as oh the various pockets of my backpack. But I like to do it of like here's my collection of potions, here's my collection of scrolls, here's my collection of stuff I use in combat. Like I love using things like caltrips and ball bearings and that kind of like mm. common adventuring gear. So I like having those break down. Uh, and then of course the spot for your coins. I think the new character sheet's better than the 2024. Um, in Quite some looking. ways, in some ways it's just different for different sake. Yeah, you know, which is fine. I'm okay with that. It looks honestly like um, when we talk about design principles, it looks more modern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The old one, and I think a lot of a lot of the the differences in this in the new to old and what we've seen from the book a little bit already is just it feels more modern, more in line, less like they were just a bunch of um, guys in their basement putting together a book and finding a cool font on yeah on on uh, fonts dot com and more like okay this is a full production mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it's definitely it's definitely a cleaner character sheet I think some of the, like the filigree and just kind of design fluff is a little bit distracting because it's like thin lines. Mm-hmm. But when you're writing it in with like a good sharpened pencil or a pen, like it's going to pop regardless. Um, I hope they have digital versions of them where you can Fillables. just type them in, which will be nice. Yeah, that's a that's what I love is a fillable character sheet yeah. where I can type in, especially the things that aren't going to change. Or you type that shit down. Yeah, that's or what, the ones that like, okay, in five levels this will change, but for now it's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's what I love about the, the character sheets that I use yeah. from the dm's guild i need to find them and make a a small video about that because they fucking rock and they're going to be as applicable for the 2024 Mm -hmm. uh at least the fully blank ones are Mm -hmm. like the class specific ones probably not as much but like having those fillable fields is spectacular big fan all right that's all we got for D and D. Let's move on to Magic: The Gathering. It is full spoiler season for Bloomboro. We are in the thick, the heat, heat of the moment. You know that one. Um, I do know that one. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen a lot of cards. We're gonna get the full set revealed here probably in the next week. Yeah. So it's like no break. <laughs> <laughs> Just going right into it. Um, couple high level things i want to point out we have the valiant um the valiant feature ability ability there we go uh, which is kind of like uh, heroic from theros back in the day except it is only the first time that you target something with a spell as opposed to any time you target something with a spell so it's a little more limited it does also accept abilities it does it does accept abilities as well which heroic was only when you cast a spell that targeted yes. the creature so little more a little more uh per turn mm-hmm. but still good still uh, good expend for example we have expend four we'll call out the baker's bane duo which is one in a green for a two two squirrel raccoon there's both a squirrel and a raccoon in the picture it is yes. not some weird crossbreed yeah it is a duo a baker's bane there duo, is no interbreeding in bloomboro oh there's absolutely interbreeding in bloomboro what are you on about there is no squirrel raccoon there is a squirrel and a raccoon for this card anyway the when they enter you create a food token and whenever you expend four they get plus one plus one until end of turn you expend four as you spend your fourth total mana to cast spells during a turn Mm -hmm. so the it's one of those if you're using up a certain amount of mana you're going to get an additional benefit so it's not like an always cast trigger something like uh like a prowess that triggers on non-creature casts or like a mage craft or something like that it's going to be a it's going to effectively be a once per turn ability and it's limited based on the amount of total mana you're spent it doesn't specify mana from lands either nope so you can if you're getting it from artifacts if you're getting it from creatures wherever rituals etc so that'll all be fun uh we also have a return of threshold yeah uh, which is as long as you can have seven or more cards in your graveyard then a creature gets some kind of benefit along with it uh is there anything else we have the gift. gift. We've talked about the gift mechanic a little bit. We've seen the gift a tapped fish, where you give someone a tapped 1-1 one, one fish. You can gift a food, where they get a food token. You can gift a card, where they draw a card. I will say, from what I, I did see a little discussion about it, and uh, 
there might be some judge calls needed uh, at at uh, of initial events because of the phrasing of gifted it like the gift for permanence versus non-permanence for example we're looking at nocturnal hunter which is an instant and the, has the ability gift of food you may promise an opponent a gift as you cast a spell if you do they create a food token before and its other effects before its other effects so it could basically it changes the card to read instant yada yada uh target opponent creates a food destroy target creature um anyway they they get the gift effect before the rest of the spell resolves but the card draw ones in particular might cause a little bit of confusion depending on how things go be simply because you you might be able to draw into a uh a counter spell mm -hmm. or something that'll get rid of it on the stack but it's, because the card is already resolving it's already it's already happening so you can't then stop it yeah um I, I would be intrigued to see if like a stifle effect would be able to but i don't but i don't i don't think that's a thing no, because I, it's not a permanent, not so it's not a triggered or an activated ability. It's a spell, yeah. Yeah. So well, yeah. we'll have to see. There there will probably be judge calls for people that are gifting cards and then they draw into a counter spell and they want to try and counter the spell that drew them the card, sort of a thing. If you have questions and you're at a game store, call a judge. 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 He's stinky. <laughs> that is that is definitely a call at some source. I'd allow it. I would allow it. Uh, all right, we're going to get into some of the cards that we want to talk about specifically. I want to first talk about a cycle of cards that we are getting, which are the mm. seasons. This is, a, this is an interesting cycle. This is a, a series of mythic sorceries uh, that are Season of Gathering, which is the green one, Season of Loss is the black one, Season of Weaving is the blue one, Season of the Bold, and Season of the Burrow are the red and white ones. These have these are modal spells, and you can select up to five paw prints worth of modes. And the first mode is a single paw print, the second mode is two, and the third one is three. Mm -hmm. So you can select up to five. So you could do the first mode five times. You could do the second mode twice and the first one once. You could do the third one once and the second one once. You could do the first, the third one once and the first one twice. And I think that's kind of all the real iterations if you wanted to maximize the number of paws yes. you were getting. Uh, so we'll start with uh, white. We'll go in. We'll go in color order. Wuber order. We'll go in Wuber order. Season of the Burrow. Three white, white for a sorcery. You choose up to five paws worth of modes. You may choose the same mode more than once. One paw, you create a one-one white rabbit creature token. Two paws, you exile target non-land permanents. It, it controller, its controller draws a card, and then for three paws, you return target permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield with an indestructible counter on it. Um. Graveyard recursion straight to the battlefield with indestructible with indestructible is going to be a great way to get back a lot of value creatures out of the graveyard. Uh, you're able to deal with problematic permanents, and if you're a go wide strategy, sometimes five one ones for mm -hmm. five mana is more than worth the cost. And you're going to be doing at least two of those things. Yeah, sometimes the same one twice. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's mo I feel like it's most likely going to, most of the time for Season of Burrow, it's going to be you exile a target non-land permanent, and then you recur something. Yeah, I imagine that'll be the case. Um, unless you are in a very specific, like, you really want tokens strategy. Or like the board just got blowed up, blown, blown up, up, blewed up. Blowed it up. All right. G and then you're like, all right, five mana, five, I now have a board of five one ones. Or in that case, recur one of your mm. value creatures and get right to the battlefield, and you get two one ones. That could also be good. It's a, it's a good it's a good recovery card from a board wipe. I'll say. Uh, Season of Weaving is the blue one. It's four blue blue, so it's one more mana. Choose up to five paws worth of modes. You can choose the same mode more than once. One paw, draw a card. Two paws, choose an artifact or creature you control. You create a token that's a copy of it. And then three paws, you return each non-land, non-token permanent to its owner's hand. Um, this one is probably the best one. It is very good. I mean, five cards for six mana, that's really good on that Hunt's is, face. That is a the worst case scenario. You're getting a five card draw for six mana. Yeah. And that is a very, very, very good rate. This is a six mana, almost cyclonic rift. Yeah. You. I mean, especially if you choose well, to 
a universal psychonic rift universal it gets your stuff too but if you're in a token deck or if you choose to create a token of something and mm-hmm. then do it and then it's like well now i still have my tokens exactly exactly and even two copies of a creature or an artifact that you control that's really pivotal or would really swing your favor in, mm-hmm. and a card draw and a card is going to be very very valuable uh this is one of my favorite ones this is a, cycle. this is a very good one uh the black card season of loss three black black choose up to five modes or five paws worth of modes you can choose the same one more than once one paw each creature each player sacrifices a creature <laughs> each creature sacrifices a player for what wow <laughs> you're just sitting there and oh no you fucking die you die this card kills actual <laughs> living human beings if you have a creature on board watsy doesn't like their t- constituents one paw each player sacrifices a creature two paws draw a card for each creature you controlled that died this turn three paws each opponent loses x life where x is the number of creature cards in your graveyard this is this in tandem with the season of the burrow for like an orjav aristocrats deck yeah uh the burrow to either create a bunch of sacrifice fodder or to recur something that you have sacrificed Mm -hmm. And then get value off of those sacrifices through Season of the Loss as well. Um, I mean, it could also be a, uh, a, 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 you know, if you have an opponent who has very few things on board. All right, that's this is basically a board wipe for you. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, you got that um, uh, uh, indestructible commander. Well, okay, you'll sacrifice a creature, and then I'll sacrifice a creature, and then I'll draw a card. Mm-hmm. So let's. I want to. I want to talk about another way that this is going to be used. You're in a you aristocrats deck. You're trying to sacrifice things for value. Mm-hmm. Your sack outlet gets removed, and mm-hmm. you've got a bunch of things you want to sack. Mm-hmm. Well, let's do one paw mode three times. Now everybody has to sacrifice something where you're getting more value out of it. Yeah, and then you can hit the two one, and you're going to be able the two paw mode, and you're going to be able to draw at least three cards. Yeah, off of that as well. This one's pretty good in an aristocrats deck. Fine in a lot of other black decks. Yeah, I was going to say most of the time the black players are fine with sacrificing their things, or mm-hmm. if you're a of tokens or something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, maybe you got gifted a one one tapped fish, for example delicious fish yum 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 season of the bold three red red choose up to five paws worth of modes you can choose the same mode more than once one paw create a tapped treasure token two paws exile the top two cards of your library until the end of your next turn you may play them and for three paws until the end of your next turn whenever you cast a spell season of the bold deals two damage to up to one target creature that three paw mode i don't think is going to be used all that often but um but impulse draw the yeah the impulse draw i think is the best mode on this one for up to four cards of impulse draw effectively that you get until the next turn so you're not going to be like oh i'm spending five mana and then i'm not able to cast any of these things you're going to be able to cast them on your next turn and then slapping down an extra treasure token as well and even five mana for five tap treasures isn't too bad if you like not really need if you know next turn is the turn you're going to pop off and you really need a lot of mana in like a storm deck or something, I could see that. Uh, it also creates token t- uh, tokens, which, oh, <laughs> hey, oh, didn't mean to click on that. But it also creates tokens. So token synergies that have access to red are going to like that a little bit, even though they're tapped. It's prob- I think it's probably the least like, like it, I mean, obviously it'll get used, that mode will get used a lot because mm-hmm. it's like, I, you know, I have one extra paw, might as well. But right. I feel like that's you're not if you're running if you're running a treasure deck, this is not what you're you don't no. want the tap treasures. Absolutely, I, this is definitely a you're trying to get impulse draw off of it. Yeah, and then that third mode, I mean, you be able to deal with a problematic creature if you really really need to, but it's a bit of a roundabout way to do that. Yeah, I mean, if that was on an enchantment, that last mode was on an enchantment, mm-hmm. that's much better because it stays Absolutely. it stays around, but Absolutely. just one turn's worth. And it is until the end of your next turn, so you get the rest of your turn and the next turn cycle where that thing's going to be pinging thing creatures for two. Yeah, but it's only creatures for two. Yeah, and it's only target creatures for two. So, not quite as good as something like I would I would prefer a gutter snipe. Right, gutter over snipe. This, yeah. Basically any other any day of the week. 
for that mode at least. And the last one, Season of Gathering. Four green, green, choose up to five paws worth of modes. You can choose the same mode more than once. One paw, you put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature you control. It gains Vigilance and Trample until end of turn. Two paws, choose an artifact, choose artifact or enchantment, destroy all permanents of the chosen type. And then three paws, you draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one is another kind of middle tier one, uh, but also a very powerful of the middle. Because I think Season of the Weaving is the top one. Uh, I think Season of the Bold is the bottom one. I agree, yeah. And then you have your Abzan ones kind of in the middle. And of them, I would put Season of Gathering above the black and the white one, just a hair. Yeah, I think it's a little more applicable to just any, to to most random strategies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um you know, put that plus one, plus one counter. You could do that mode once. It doesn't say different creatures, so you can put it on two on a three, three, and then draw five cards. Exactly. Uh, I think the card draw mode on it is the big one here. Yeah. Uh, you also have the upside of it's six mana, and it could be a mini crater hoof. Oh, yeah. Vigilance, trample, and plus one, plus one counters on a board of three threes on a board of two twos on a board like it's not going to be like crater hoof where you're getting giving everything like plus seven plus seven in yeah. trample it's not gonna it might not win you the game but it might be able to close out a game for you but yeah sometimes knock just, out a player yeah if you you know pushing through a couple of blockers here or there mm -hmm. that's that's all you need sometimes exactly uh just wiping all artifacts or enchantments also not too bad uh, in commander especially it could be very very good again i mean obviously great against an artifact or an enchantment tech. right uh but if you if you elect for if you make a design choice for your deck where like i'm only doing land ramp mm -hmm. and you forego artifact ramp and enchantment based ramp then suddenly you could select that mode twice and just destroy so much value on the board yeah uh, and then keep a lot for yourself while also slapping a 1-1 one -one counter on something. So I think of, of the middle tier ones, I, if I were to rank them, you can give your ranking here. If mm -hmm. I were to rank them, Season of Weaving, the blue at the top. Yeah. Season of Gathering, green, second. Season of Loss, third. Even though it's more specific to an aristocrat's thing, the card draw and uh, the life loss aspects, or the card draw and the player sacrifice modes of it i think are really good the white one is just barely under that because i think that one one rabbit mode for the one ones is probably the least powerful of all the one paw hmm. modes uh and it is and its best mode is just a board wipe yeah which there's better board wipes and then the last one is season of the bold just because that that three paw mode is almost never going to be used and that one paw mode it the treasure being tapped is just not yeah as good i think those rankings are pretty good um i think season of the loss while you evolve good in aristocrats decks is also just good in most decks that are have black in them um i mean drawing cards it, the the drawing card yeah again like you could board wipe and then draw a bunch of cards twice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then force somebody to sacrifice something i don't know but no uh, yeah, i am probably this is going to be a, a uh, their pre-sale prices, of course, right now are listed below are in the 30s and 40s. They're mythics, so they're going to be harder to pull. I imagine those prices are going to go way down. Probably, but I, 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 I could think, see these in the $10 range. I think so. I yeah. think so. Those are good cards. Uh, do you have anything you specifically want to call out? I have a, I have a couple of things. Um, some of these are for more of their uh, uh, design choices and some that we'll see in set. First one is the Dower Port Mage. Yeah. Dower Port Mage, uh, it's a one and a blue for a frog wizard, one three. Whenever one or more creatures you control leave the battlefield without dying, draw a card. Uh, then it also has a one blue and tap, return target another target creature you control to its owner's hand. Um, this, this uh, when it other uh, leaves the battlefield without dying, we're seeing on a couple of cards throughout the set already. And it's an interesting design space, obviously. Gonna be great for your flicker effects. Gonna be great flicker. There's all. There's also a lot of bounce effects. That mm -hmm. are very powerful too. Um, it's an interesting kind of archetype to build around. It is. Uh, I don't think we we just see a commander in here that wants that specifically. I mean, uh, we just did get Genku Future Shaper, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's another way to build it. Uh, like you said, flicker is obviously a top tier, but if we want to get into maybe like 
some slightly more chill levels of play, mm. this is a very interesting place to build. And having a two mana tap to bounce a problematic permanent or to protect one of your valuable permanents and then get a card draw off of it as mm-hmm. well as just a little extra value while you're protecting something, I think is a good, yeah. a good, very good, especially for a two mana creature that's got a three, three, uh, three blocking. Good three butt. God. Three butt. It's got a three <laughs> butt. <laughs> All right. Next one I want to talk about is Feed the Cycle. This one uh, for the, uh, it's one of the other set mechanics, Forage. Mm. It's one in a black for an instant that says as an additional cost to cast this spell, Forage or pay a black. Uh, to forage, exile three cards from your graveyard or sacrifice a food, and then you can destroy Tark Creature or Planeswalker. Yeah, this is going to go hard in the Hobbit's precon. Oh, yeah. It goes and hard in any food strategy. And even wor- in not food strategies. Well, in in a worst case scenario, this is murder that hits a Planeswalker as well. Yeah. So it, worst case scenario, it's one black black. And even then, you, you know, uh, uh, you all... You, Most of the time, you're probably going to have things in your graveyard. Exiling three cards from a graveyard in a lot of decks doesn't mean anything. Especially in black. Especially in black. I want to shout out a very important reprint here, Mm. which is the Fabled Passage. Uh, It's a land that you... It is, on its face, is Evolving Wilds. Tap, sacrifice Fable Passage, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle. The difference is... Then, if you control four or more lands, you untap that land. So Fabled Passage, if it is your fourth land drop or later, is going to fetch you a basic untapped. Yeah. Which is very, very valuable. And it has not been reprinted in a while. So it's one of those cards that's like pretty good, but a casual player is not going to pay eight to eight to fifteen dollars for it and now it's getting reprinted you can already see the base reprint it's being it's a rare in this set so it's not going to be super easy to find and crash the price but it's still going to be a five dollar card as opposed to a fifteen dollar card i feel like fable of passage should just be in pre-cons as either a replacement for evolving wilds or in addition to evolving wilds yeah i'd be cool with that a uh, little shout out to I don't really, we don't need to spend much time on heirloom epic, but uh, it has it's an artifact for one with a four and tap draw a card, uh, but you can basically convoke that ability. You can yeah. tap untap creatures to pay for rather than paying man cost, which is cool. Um, we both wanted to talk about Kitsa. Yeah, Kitsa is a very the Kitsa Otterball Elite is a very interesting card. Go ahead. Yes, uh, one in a blue for a one three legendary otter wizard. He is Vigilance and Prowess. You can tap to loot, so draw a card, then discard a card. Or you can pay two and tap to copy target instant or sorcery spell you control. You can choose new targets for the copy, and you can only activate it if Kitsa's power is three or greater. So effectively, you need to get two spells cast to proc Prowess twice to get it up to a three five, and then you can activate the copy a spell Mm -hmm. mode. Uh, A two mana one three Vigilant Prowess commander that loots you when you tap it and then has the mode to copy a spell later when you've been casting a lot of spells and starting to storm off is a pretty good rate yeah i would say that's pretty good i would argue because it's mono blue it would probably go better in the 99 of other decks specific i of course am obsessed with prowess i have narset enlightened exile so a two mana one three vigilant prowess that gets prowess from narset and then can loot me or copy something and Mm -hmm. all i need to do is by the way, cast the card. If I want to copy one thing and I cast that one thing, if Narset's on the battlefield, giving him a second iteration of prowess, which prowesses do stack, by the way. There yes. are cards that are written with prowess, prowess, and they trigger separately. They get the pro- gets the prowess triggers, resolve the prowess triggers, card is still on the stack. You can then pay two, tap, and copy it. Yeah. Because Kitsa's power will already be three or higher because prowess procced twice. And it's vigilant, so you can attack and then do stuff on your second main with the tap effects as well. Yeah. I like that card a lot. If I pull a Kitsa, or if Kitsa's like a dollar after release, it's currently pre releasing for $9.99. We'll see how much that actually goes for later. Uh, but that would slot perfectly into Narset and Lion Dexo. Anyway. Uh, next one I want to talk about is Jackdaw Savior. Um, yeah. It is a. Two and a white for a 3-1 bird cleric with flying. 
and says whenever it or another creature you control with flying dies, return another target creature card with lesser mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, this is the luminous. This is kind of luminous brood moth combined mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. Um, combined with scrap trawler. Which Scrap Trawler does when it or another creature, another artifact creature dies, mm-hmm. or an artifact goes to the graveyard, you get to grab out a lesser mana value thing. Yeah. Um, there are... It's a, interesting to build that around flying. Yeah. We've seen a couple of different things in the past several sets really focus on flying. And, uh, and we do know that uh, even 30 years into Magic... Flying just slaps. Flying is one of those keywords that's just kind of always going to be good, in a way. People, some people can still just not be able to deal with flying. Absolutely, absolutely, it's crazy. I, I'm a bit, I'm a big fan. Um, it's gonna go hard in like a, uh, oh, what's the, what's the Azorius bird from Lord of the Gwai here? Yeah. Uh, anything that any. Any car, any commander, any deck that really cares about flying specifically, that's just going to be extra recursion for oh, you. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to talk about Helga, Skittish Seer. Mm-hmm. Green, white, blue for a 1-3 legendary frog druid. There's a lot of 1-3s in this. Set. A lot of 1-3s. Whenever you cast a creature spell with mana value 4 or greater, you draw a card, gain a life, and put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on Helga, Skittish Seer. You can tap to add X mana of any one color where X is Helga Skittish Seer's power. Spend this mana only to cast creature spells with mana value 4 or greater or creature spells with X in their mana costs. This is a $41 card. Uh, what color? What, what's the name of the color for? Bant. Bant. Um, I feel like this is going to be a big CDH commander. Because you gotta, you got to think about the three big things that, you, that CDH players want their commanders to do. They want you to. They want it to be removal or ramp, mm-hmm. card draw, or mana production. Card draw and mana production. Yeah. And what I like is that this is going to be kind of a get yourself get your pod out of mid range hell sort of a deck. Mm. Because the mid range hell of higher levels of play of just like card draw value, all this shit, counter spells, combos, all this shit. It's like okay. I'm putting down big fuck off creatures <laughs> and I'm going to be drawing from them. I'm going to be gaining life. I'm going to be generating mana specifically for them. And you're not going to stop me because you get access to white and blue. So you still get access to the Ristic Studies, the Mystic Remoras, all the best counter spells. You get access to the best stacks pieces in white. You get access to Silence. Mm-hmm. You get access to Green. So you're gonna be you can get things like Helvala in there for extra mana production. You get some of the best creature and end- game enders with Craterhoof Behemoth. You get the white Craterhoof Behemoth even Moonshaker Cavalry. Exactly. So I love that just from. Specifically, the CEDH perspective of breaking out of mid-range hell Mm -hmm. that a lot of modern, more current commander games can kind of fall into of just Mm. trying to generate a lot of value. And it's like, no, you can be drawing your cards. You need to have an answer for the fucking 9-9 flyer that I have coming at you now that's going to trample over you. Mr. Ooh, I'm going to sack a whole bunch of things. I'm going to ad nauseum myself down to four. Watch out. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I want to talk about one that's a little bit on the opposite end of the. It, it's, it's got va- uh, uh, We're gonna look for Vren the Relentless. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's in this. It's. Uh, I'll read it off. It's two blue black for a legendary rat rogue three four with ward two. If a creature an opponent would would die, if a creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. At the beginning of your end step, create X11 black rat creature tokens with this creature gets plus one plus one for each rat you control, where X is the number of creatures your opponents that your opponents control that died this turn. Exiled. Exiled. Yep. This turn. They are died, and then he exiles them. So <sighs> Pack rats. Pack rats. Pack rats. He creates pack rats. He creates token pack rats. Um and in black and in blue, you got a lot of ways to en masse kill things. Yeah. 
What's weird about this is what you really want is your opponents to have board states. Mm -hmm. And then you want to kill those board states. But so it's this weird area of like you, you want them to come down and then there and then there to be a one sided board wipe or you or you play the uh, the season of sorrow where a bunch of things get sacked. It's just this it's like you definitely can't really play this at the lower levels where people where the uh, people are building these big board states of of nothingness a lot of times you know a lot of one ones a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, generically tokens. kind of valuable creatures yeah uh but also if you try to play this on the upper end of things man one less creature based stuff oftentimes but two a lot more removal yeah and yeah this thing has word two. this thing needs word two. absolutely but even then if you're like if you're threatening if you this comes down people are like well that's that's annoying yeah, I'll pay three mana to exile that with my swords to plowshare. Exactly, and I like I like that they've been moving towards the design of I'm making. They're gonna make cards where you're generating tokens that are effectively tokens of cards that already exist. Mm -hmm. we, we're obviously seeing that with Offspring in Bloomborough, where you're getting a token that is effectively a copy of a creature that you're casting. Yeah. But, like, making the the Tarmogoyf tokens from yeah. Modern Horizons 3, making effectively Pack Rats mm -hmm. tokens uh, is going to be... It's an interesting design space to exist in in the first place. Um <sighs> I also I feel like you can also build this around death touch creatures. Sure. Um, I, there's you could do sub themes of like goad, um, where you're making your opponents attack one another. It's goad's a major color, or ma more major in red than blue black. But yeah, there there's still there's a fair amount of demir based goading effects. There are some, yeah. Um, but it. You got to get your opponents to kill things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great counter for an, uh, uh, an Orzhov aristocrat uh, or any aristocrats deck. That's true. Really. Um, bounce effects are going to be a problem for you. Um, man, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. It's in a weird space. Yeah. Where it seems really cool and really powerful. Black has a lot of also direct to exile cards as true. well. Um I think see, season of loss, forcing sacrifices on everyone is going to be useful. But even but here's the other thing: you can just make it a pack rats deck, you where could. you where you emphasize your removal in the form of destruction and exile, mm -hmm. and then you slap down your commander, and then you're just getting more pack rats production that are going to be more valuable because even if you're making one token. That's making everything else plus one plus one, and then that token is going to be like a fucking eight eight or yeah. something. So I, I feel like that's it's very narrow. Exactly. Uh, I I have one card that I would like to talk about. Yeah. Flubs. Flubs. So this is a promo card. Uh, by I believe it's the buy box promo. Um, or sorry, Bloomberg Commander. Commander Miscellaneous Pro. It's got it's got the Commander set symbol, so it's not legal in like anything but Commander and Legacy and stuff. Flubs the fool. Green Flubs you fool. Flubs you fool. Green, blue, red for a zero five legendary frog scout. That reads, you may play an additional land on each of your turns. Whenever you play a land or cast a spell, draw a card if you have no cards in your hand. Otherwise, discard a card. This is kind of actively a bad card in some ways. It is actively a bad card in a traditional kind of deck yes. building way. But you get access to a lot of very fun things. If you build around impulse draw, graveyard mm -hmm. recursion, flashback, um, uh, plot, uh, uh, foretell, that kind of shit where you're getting cards out of your hand and you can save them for later not in your hand. Mm -hmm. Things like even, you get a big game ender like an Underworld Breach, that kind of stuff. It's in the right colors for Underworld Breach. It is. Um, playing multiple lands on every single one of your turns means you're not going to just have, like you're not going to be like, oh, I 
play a land. I play a land. I have no cards in my hand. I draw a card. Oh, it's another land. Well, I can play that. Let's draw another card. Yeah. So you're going to be ramping with them a little bit. You're, it's it's very weird, and there's a lot of people like, is this bad, or is this like secretly really good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The interaction with it is going to be very interesting. Like, when you're trying to interact on other players' turns. Because obviously, you know, on your turn a lot of the times, having a, a lot of sorceries or things with flashback... Or those impulse draws often say on your turn. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of playing even with no hand. So you're kind of playing with your hand just out. So yeah, you gotta wait. You gotta have those foretell cards in there to be able to be like counterspell <laughs> or things like that. Or For- yeah, foretell, flashback, and even plot to a lesser extent because plots sorcery speed. Plots, a l- yeah. Uh, landfall synergies going landfall, to be very big. Great. Uh, there's going to be situations where you're going to be able to drop five lands in a turn. Um, getting something like a Crucible of Worlds, where you can then play lands from your graveyard, mm-hmm. is going to be useful. And then you're just basically casting whatever you draw immediately. And just kind of uh, forcing yourself into a top deck situation. Uh, or just letting it go to the graveyard by discarding it, if if it's more valuable to you in your Ooh, yard. Some mad- throwing some madness in there. Madness, because you discard a card and then you get to cast it from exile. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of weird things that this commander is going to be able to yeah. facilitate, and most of it's not that great, <laughs> <laughs> but some of it's like really neat at the same time. Um, yeah, it's. I I don't have. I just I'm wanted to point it out because it's not really going fucking to, weird. I'm not going to build it. I can't wait to see somebody on one of the Commander Gameplay shows play a Flubs deck. Oh, absolutely. Someone's going to do that. 100% someone's going to do that. Um, there's a lot of cards that are like kind of worth mentioning a little bit. The three We talked about a three-tree city. It's going to have multiple arts depending on the seasons. It's a good creature type uh, land card that's effectively uh, Nyxos Shrine to Nyx for... Type for creature, decks. Yeah. Uh we're getting we're getting some interesting power creeps. Like we're getting a goblin electromancer power creep with the storm catch mentor. It's gonna have haste and prowess in addition to reducing yeah. instance and sorceries. Some people are saying Fell is a um is a power craft murder, but it's sorcery speed instead of instant speed. Hop to it, three mana, create three one ones, sure. Um, the whole lot of gift cards. I think the gift cards are going to stand out as particularly powerful in this set. Especially uh, in Commander. Ooh, yeah. In Commander, even in Limited, I think they're going to be very, very powerful. Um, but Commander especially just getting additional. It You're getting Kicker without having to spend more mana. Yes, I know, Lincoln. <laughs> I know you say it's not Kicker. But it's Kicker. You're paying an additional cost and you get an additional benefit out of it. That's all Kicker has ever really been. I will hold firm to this. It's basically kicker. Last one I want to talk about is sugar coat. Um, mm-hmm. It's nothing. Fu- it's nothing that interesting. It's a it's two. Funny. Two and it's funny. It's two in a blue aura. Uh, two in a blue for an aura enchantment with flash enchant creature or food. Uh, and enchant permanent is a colorless food artifact creature or food artifact with. It's a food and lose all other creature types and abilities. Uh, it just has the line. It has to be able to enchant a food. Because the creature becomes a food, exactly. it would fall off. It's the same It's the same as the reanimate aura, mm-hmm. where you have to have that additional line of enchant creature or food, because it becomes a food, and then if it is a food and not a creature anymore, then the aura just... Yep. Yeah. Also, In- instant speed. Instant speed. Great removal. Very cute. Delicious. Also, the, uh, the, <laughs> the flavor text, some jokes have the punchline baked in. Me <laughs> slapping. All right, that's all I have to that's say about great. Blue Yep, Bro. That's great. At um, this point, we're going to wrap up the podcast as we do with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the audience. Uh, you can catch us live on TikTok where we're going to take questions there. Uh, you can also do the Patreon thread to ask questions for the podcast. Uh, but what do we got from the TikTok live chat? Christine says that they love the art on Flubs. Flubs is, yeah, Flubs' art is great. They're doing, there's a lot of art that's referencing like weird old paintings and stuff. Yeah, I know there's some water shipped down. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. Not, never a thing I was into, but I know that's, that's got some references. It's a cool vibe. It's a cool vibe, and I'm into the vibe. So we're here for the vibes. We are here for the vibes. That's, that, that's all really in That's the... fine. We, this, it's a light news week. 
We had a massive news week last time. We kind of rushed things a little bit, which you got to do sometimes. But we were rushing. We're a little over. We're a little over hour fifteen. I think yeah. that's okay. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, it'll actually be a bit less because the audio cut out. That's right. For some reason, I hope that edits fine. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll come back and I'll, I'll be doing a pickup randomly, and you won't see my face for a little bit, which is, you know, a whole thing. It's a great thing. It's a whole thing. It's a whole but thing. with all that being said, of course, you can check us out every other week on. Uh, podcast services around the globe apple google spotify youtube music all that stuff on mondays at 12 30 p.m eastern standard time if you want to catch it early you can get us a week early on wednesday before it releases on patreon.com slash dungeon bros the five dollar tier you can join for free on patreon as well if you want to get access to the feed and comments and all that kind of stuff you can ask questions for the podcast it's a great time head on over there and with all that said we love you very much peace